initially located the family, um, it was there was no obvious signs of trauma or obvious signs of cause of death, and so that's when we had to um, slow down for the safety of the rescuers. A death investigation that has law enforcement seemingly stumped, and even considering their prime suspect might be Mother Nature. Hey everyone, John Lorden. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Brain Scratch as we look into one of the strangest death investigations that I can recall. Um, it actually takes me back a bit to the start of this show, looking into mysteries that th the reasonable explanations just don't seem to be at play. And what are you left with after that? How do you find the truth, come to some conclusion? And in this case, we have a terrible tragedy, an entire family wiped out on something as simple as doing a little day hike, just a family going out together and never coming home. Let's get into the articles here and learn about what happened. This did start as a missing persons investigation, so I wanna start it with that story. This is over at kmph.com. The Mariposa County Sheriff's Office says a family has been reported missing since Saturday. A family friend says Ellen Chung and Jonathan Jerish went missing with their child and a family dog. The last contact was a photo that they uploaded Sunday at 6.45 a.m. of the baby backpack that they take with them. The couple is originally from San Francisco, but they now live in Mariposa. Uh, Rosanna Heaslett says they did not return home or to work on Monday. She says... They hike on weekends, and they're hoping that someone may have seen them so we can give the additional info to the sheriff's office. They drive a newer, dark gray Ford Raptor, possibly a 2020. Jonathan, about six feet, two inches tall with long hair, wears it in a ponytail and has a prominent English accent. Ellen is a petite Korean woman with an athletic build. They have a one-year-old daughter and a golden retriever who would be with them as well. And... Um, it's really a tragic aspect to this because the one-year-old, literally her birthday is a matter of just a week or two before this happens. Her name is, uh, I believe it's Aurelia Michu, uh, based on uh, some information that I saw on social media. If you do look into the articles on this case, it seems like there was a misspelling that came out very early in regards to her name. You might see Muji, M-U-J-I, but uh, from what I've been able to tell, it's actually Miju, M-I-J-U. Uh, so what happens? Over at sanfrancisco.cbslocal.com, this is an article from August 17th. Missing Mariposa family found dead in Sierra National Forest. The entire family, all of them, and their dog. A family that had been reported missing was found dead along with the family's dog on a hiking trail in a remote area of the Sierra National Forest Authority said search teams initially located the family's vehicle near a gate to the Sierra National Forest and then found the bodies of all three identified as John Jerish, Ellen Chung, their one year old daughter, Miju, and their dog. Uh, their dog's name is Oski. Um, they were near an area known as Devil's Gulch in the South Fork of the Merced River, the Mariposa County Sheriff's Office said. There was no clear cause of death, so no obvious wounds. Uh, and keep in mind, this is a very fast effort that happens. Uh, essentially, um, they own a home in this area. They had bought several homes uh, to use as, as rental properties. I don't know if this was their primary home or not, but they have a home in this area. And when authorities get the call about this missing persons case, uh, I believe it's one deputy in particular that kind of acts on a hunch, according to one of these articles, and decides that um, he's going to go check the entrances to the park close to where that home was. And he's the one that actually finds their vehicle. Um, but they are only missing, I mean, they go out on a Sunday for this hike. They're noticed missing on Monday. The report is called in that Monday. I believe it's in the early, early morning hours of Tuesday uh, that they are actually found, like 2.30 a.m., uh, well, at least when the vehicle is found. And then they prep for the search efforts for the, ne for the next morning, and uh, they do find them early that next morning. 
with, with no clear cause of death. I mean, that's it's just, it's, it's mind blowing. The remote area where the bodies were found had no cell phone service. It was close to the Height Cove Trail, known particularly in springtime to have spectacular wildflower displays. So let's learn just a little bit about this area. This is taking place in Mariposa County. It's a county in the U.S. state of California. As of the 2010 census, the population was just over 18,000 people. It's located in the western foothills of the Sierra Nevada Mountains, north of Fresno, east of Merced, and southeast of Stockton. The county's eastern section is the central portion of Yosemite National Park. Um, and we can see from the photos here, certainly uh, a beautiful area. And here you get a sense of where it is in terms of the state of California, kind of right in the, the heart of California. Uh, for Height Cove in particular, there's a trail at Height Cove. And some of the reporting on this, um, I don't know if the details were just coming out too quick. Some of the reporting is making it sound like they might have been using this trail um, then later reporting kind of firms up, the details get better. I don't think they were using this trail, but just to go over it, this trail is two to four miles. Um, it would be, you know, between three and six as a round trip and the elevation is 1900 feet. They consider this an easy trail and they estimate your time out. There would be two to five hours. Um, the actual, and as a matter of fact, there's even this map that's kind of kicking around and this kind of. I think is helping with that confusion. You can see the path that they've got here is um, where they're saying the search teams found the family vehicle and the Height Cove Trail. And following the Height Cove Trail, they're following uh, the Merced River, I believe, actually all the way down to where they're found in this area known as, I'm seeing it referred to as Devil's Gulch in the articles, but it's Devil Gulch, according to Google Maps and some other sources. Um, one of the things I was struggling with was I pulled this up on Google Maps and I kept seeing these references to they were found about two miles away from their vehicle. Well, if you actually look at this on, on a map from Google, it's way more than two. It's more uh, it's it's like between six and ten, somewhere like that, just kind of guesstimating it based on the uh, little indicators I have there. So I, I kind of felt like something was wrong with this map. Now there's this map that has come out uh, that has come out and it says that the parked car was actually here on Heights Cove Road. And I think that's part of why we have this confusion happening. There's a different trail that's being used here with a bunch of switchbacks. You can see it's pretty obvious the switchbacks are here. The area where the family's found essentially right in the middle of that trail. That trail is called the Savage Lundy Trail. And it is a three mile long trail and it's the most difficult trail in the area. At the USDA Forestry Service, we have another um, explanation here. They're saying that the Savage Lundy Trail is actually 2.6 miles long, and it ends at the South Fork of the Merced. So going back to this map, it looks like it literally is just this trail from where the end of the road is, where their car was parked. Uh, all these switchbacks are probably adding up a pretty considerable distance and then getting to the South Fork of the Merced River somewhere in here, they consider at the end of that trail. Um, so I think that helps clear it up just a little bit. I just really been struggling with trying to understand uh, the locations based on the different explanations I'm seeing in the articles. In terms of what's going on for the weather there, Sunday, August 15th. Now, keep in mind, we have that picture of the backpack that's that goes out on social media in the morning, somewhere around six o'clock in the morning. I would think that's probably some type of estimate about the time that they're heading out or possibly getting started. We don't know that it's a picture of the backpack actually out on a trail. It could be them you know, gearing up at home or something like that. Um, but what we're looking at here on the lows, you know, 68 on the highs up to 84, basically for the morning hours. Then once it starts getting into the afternoon, the heat comes up pretty seriously on the lows. It's at 88, the highs as high as 97 other news reports that I'm seeing are even pushing it up over a hundred for that afternoon. Uh, and then off into the evening, still relatively high temperatures. So, uh, another possible consideration here could be exposure. Um, I've looked at some social media for this family, and I got to tell you, it seems like they're pretty familiar with the outdoors. I'd be really surprised if they didn't pack enough water or elements to help protect them um, from, from that. And just based off the time frame that we heard for that picture, I'm thinking they probably left uh, at some point in the morning, but I'm not seeing real strong time frames on that. 
A uh, California family that mysteriously died hiking near Yosemite had moved to enjoy the outdoors. They actually left the Bay Area um, to, to get closer to nature effectively. And it's just another very tragic aspect of this story. The Mariposa couple loved the great outdoors. They packed up their hustle and bustle life in San Francisco for the mountains of Central California. Some of the stuff I've run into... Um, Apparently, in San Francisco, they were living it up too. both of them acting as DJs. They were part of the burner community or people that go to Burning Man. Um, seems like maybe they were hitting a different phase in their life, now having a child, wanting to slow things down a little bit, kind of reconnect with nature. The couple moved to the area during the coronavirus pandemic after Jerish had the opportunity to, to work from home as a software engineer, a family friend said. That friend's name is Steve Jeff, and we're going to see him referred to in several of these articles. They had envisioned raising their daughter, Miju, in a quiet, slow-paced environment surrounded by open air and close to the mountains for hiking and camping adventures. That's another thing in some of the early reports I was seeing a clarification, so I just want to get it out there. I think people are assuming that they were camping when this happened. And from the information I'm seeing, that's not the case. This was a day hike. This is literally them just going out for a number of hours, kind of out and back. Um, I think because of some of the things that people are considering with environmental factors that might be responsible for this, it's easier to imagine that happening in a tent situation, particularly something like carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, no tent situation is going on with this story. On Monday, when their nanny arrived at their home to watch Miju and no one answered the door, those close to Jerish and Chung became worried. Quote, you had to figure it wasn't an overnight hike because it's been hot and they had the baby with them, Jeff said in a telephone interview. John was supposed to work Monday and never showed up. That raised more concerns. A missing persons report was filed Monday. Their bodies were found on a hiking trail sometime before 10 a.m. on Tuesday. Uh, Jeff called the situation freaky and strange. Seriously, we're all just devastated. They were really beloved, a super generous, sweet and loving couple that was devoted to their daughter. It's just a tragedy. You have people who pass away and die, and that's always sad. This one is just so freaky and strange. It's really, really sad. They had so much going for them. It was Jeff who shared with Jerish the pros and cons of relocating to Mariposa, having spent the past seven years splitting time between the two areas himself. Jerish originally was from England and previously was a software engineer for Google, but he was currently working for Snapchat. Chung originally was from Orange in Southern California and was a yoga instructor prior to her pregnancy. She was going to graduate school, studying to become a marriage and family therapist. They were doting parents, Jeff said. For this to happen to them and to their baby girl, it's exceedingly tragic. Over at mirror.co.uk, here is a picture of the family. And one of the first considerations that we've already kind of briefly touched on, carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide may have been what killed a British dad, his wife, and one-year-old daughter. Because of the mystery surrounding the family's death and the presence of mines, the area where the bodies were found is being treated as a hazmat or hazardous materials scene. So possible mines in the area. It's interesting because mines come up in missing persons cases somewhat frequently, um, but not in this manner. Uh, typically, they're areas of danger. Uh, sometimes they've been boarded up. The wood has degraded to a point where someone, you could take a step not even knowing it's there. The wood gives away and you've got a very traumatic and serious fall that happens because of, of the structure of, of those mines and how they're built. We've all heard of the phrase, you know, the canary in the coal mine, but that's about the risks of actually working within a mine. I hadn't really heard of dangers of just being around mines, uh, at least in this way before. Deputy Mitchell said, coming across a scene where everyone involved, including the family dog that is deceased, that is not a typical thing that we've seen or other agencies have seen. Couple that up with the fact that you have no obvious physical signs of trauma, very hard to believe. I mean, take into consideration for a moment, some environmental factor like this, some level of poisoning of some kind. You've got very different body sizes, 
we we know uh, we know John's a big guy, six foot two. Um, we know his wife been been described as petite. They've got a one year old baby with them. They've got a dog with them. We've got a lot of different examples of physiology that's going on there. And for a poisoning situation to just wipe all of them out in the same instance really makes you think this has to be something substantial extremely dangerous and if it is that substantial and extremely dangerous shouldn't it be somewhat easy to detect um i don't know it's it's really just bizarre considerations around this the officer could not rule out carbon monoxide as the cause of death this is why we're treating it as a hazmat situation we just don't know she said Several of these articles also point to this other instance. In 2013, two gold and silver miners died in Colorado after being exposed to deadly ranges of carbon monoxide. Uh, so I just want to look into that story just a little bit to understand it better because I want to see, is that really applying to the situation we're talking about here? Uh, over here at NPR.org, two killed, 20 injured. The Ure County Coroner's preliminary report says the men died of carbon monoxide poisoning. Investigators with the Federal Mine Safety and Health Administration are still trying to determine exactly what happened inside the Revenue Virginius mine. Carbon monoxide is a byproduct of explosives commonly used in mining. A manager with the mine's owning company says the injured and killed miners had not been using explosives Sunday and that the carbon monoxide may have lingered from blasting that happened the day before. Now, this is an active mine site that we're talking about. They've got work that's going on there, obviously. They're blasting the day before. Uh, it also goes into the fact that these guys are supposed to be wearing devices that actually, uh, they're alarms, carbon monoxide alarms. If it comes into contact, it starts beeping, and you know you're supposed to get out of there. Uh, it doesn't clarify if they were wearing that type of equipment, but reportedly they were supposed to be. Killed were Nick Capano, 34, of Montrose, and Rick Williams, 59, of Durango. Of the 29 injured miners, four were admitted overnight to three area hospitals. The rest were treated and released for minor injuries. So for as much as I'm seeing this story come up in terms of being somewhat related to the story of this family that we're looking at, I, I'm not really seeing a strong connection. We're talking... This is an industrial accident that happened in Colorado back in 2013. This isn't a, f a family taking an afternoon or a morning hike. Um, so I'm, I'm just, I'm really not sure. Um, but abandoned mines are a great safety hazard. Um, the dangers that are found, uh, all, some of the obvious ones that I've mentioned before, but I, re I really want to keep it focused in terms of what could be affecting the family. So I'm going to jump down at this article here at fs.fed.us. Bad air is one of a miner's greatest fears. While most dangers are obvious, air containing poisonous gases or insufficient oxygen cannot be detected until too late. Poisonous gases accumulate in low areas and along the floor. Walking into these low spots causes the good air above to stir up the bad air below producing a potentially lethal mixture. Standing water absorbs many gases. These gases will remain in the water until it's disturbed. This can happen when someone walks through it as the gases are released. They rise behind the walker where they remain as an unseen danger when the person retraces his steps. So once again, this is kind of talking about working in an actual mine. But that last information there about the gases being trapped by water uh, and then when someone comes along and disturbs it, that releases the gases. It's just another environmental factor, knowing that the end of this trail, it's just, there's a little connectivity that's lighting up in my brain on that. The end of this trail is them getting to a water source. Now we're going to learn there's a, there's a whole different fear in terms of that water source and how it could have affected them. But just thinking about that possibility, some type of dangerous gas that's in that water source, they don't know about it. <clears throat> maybe they go splash around in it. Maybe they don't. Maybe the dog runs into it and disturbs it. Um, and that that can be a problem as well. It's just, it's another thing that I, I can't uh, get out of my mind when you're looking at this story. And this is a picture of Oski, um, obviously a, a beautiful, beautiful dog. Uh, but over here at timesnewexpress.com, we get a professional commenting on the theory of the gold mines. Dr. Mike Nelson, professor of mining engineering at University of Utah, 
cast doubt on the theory that carbon monoxide emissions from an old gold mine were possibly to blame for the deaths. Nelson explained that gold mines are not known to produce carbon monoxide. At least that's one thing we could learn from the Colorado situation. Like they were literally blasting the day before. We know that they're creating carbon monoxide with that act. Think of old mines that aren't being actively used. Um, what's the mechanism for carbon monoxide to be created there just randomly? Um, so he, he's, he's pointing that out here. Uh, even if the gas was present, it would have gone up into the air. He also noted that the family were found outdoors and not in an enclosed space where exposure to carbon monoxide could be lethal. As of Wednesday afternoon, this is just another tragic aspect of this, the bodies of the family remained in the canyon. So they were found on Tuesday, but of course, seeing that the, their, the reason for their death isn't obvious, they had to treat it as a hazmat situation. And because of that, um, they actually wind up leaving the bodies there for another day, but then they do actually get them out and get them to a medical examiner. The area is so remote, the workers have to leave the area just to get a signal to communicate back to headquarters, Mitchell said. The bodies will be transported to the medical examiner's office and will undergo autopsies. If the medical examiner decides to conduct toxicology tests, could be up to six weeks before the causes of the death are revealed. Commenting on the lack of an obvious cause of death, the spokeswoman for the sheriff's office, Ms. Mitchell, said that forensic experts were looking into the possibility that the family had been poisoned by toxic algae. So now we're moving into a different environmental consideration. Uh, so I started looking into this. I, I had never heard of this aspect before either. Uh, can toxic algae kill humans. Over here at USA Today, we get some information on this. Staff from the Central Valley Water Board have put out signs around Hensley Lake warning people about harmful bright green algae in the water, urging pets and children to stay away from the algae, which contains toxins that are dangerous to humans and animals if ingested. University of Southern California expert Dr. David Karen told reporters many water bodies around the country, not just in California, are reaching a tipping point. Back in July, harmful blue-green algae prompted beach closures and warnings in Vermont, Rhode Island, and Ohio. The U.S. Forest Service in July reported toxic algae was found earlier in the summer in an area roughly three miles north of where the family was found. The new Hensley Lake warning is less than 50 miles away from where the family was found. What is toxic algae? In balanced ecosystems, the tiny aquatic plants can grow quickly and usually occur in late summer or early fall, We're certainly in the right time frame for that. When nutrients are right in the water, the bloom can grow, and during that process, harmful cyanotoxins can be released. They're typically visible because of their bright color in the water or as a foamy layer near the surface. And I can tell you, living in an area where we've got tons of standing water sources, um, I see this kind of stuff on a, on a regular basis. Can it kill humans? Toxic algae can be fatal if a person drinks water from a bloom that contains certain toxins. Now I've looked even more into this. I'm trying to find a particular occurrence of a human that died from toxic algae poisoning of some kind. I can't. I'm finding numerous warnings several articles talking about it being a possibility. I'm finding a lot of articles talking about dogs that have passed away from consuming that type of water, a lot. Uh, but for humans in particular, I'm not. And I'm still wondering, is this even in the realm of possibility? Once again, because of that example I brought up before, physiological differences between an adult male, an adult woman, a child, and a dog the like the level of toxicity would have to be so crazy. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, I'm having trouble confirming if it actually can, or I'm having trouble confirming if it has killed humans. I'm seeing enough warnings that are extremely clear. It is possible. Um, and it could be maybe just that that type of thing hasn't hit the news for some reason, hasn't been seen as newsworthy. Maybe this is the case that's going to do that to raise exposure to it. I, I don't know. Uh, but continuing back here, toxic algae can be found all across the globe and you can usually tell its presence by its smell. Oftentimes, it really almost like it hurts your nose. 
it's like an acid almost that burns in your nose a little bit. So for anyone else that is uh, concerned about this after watching today's episode, like I am after researching today's episode, uh, at least there's a little bit of a warning indicator. Over at mywaterquality.ca.gov, uh, they have an article about human health and HABs. HAB stands for uh, harmful agal blooms. Human exposure to HABs most commonly occurs through ingestion or skin contact with contaminated water. Inhalation of spray or mist may also contribute to exposure during activities such as water or jet skiing. We certainly don't have that. Um, I don't know if they would have got to that part of the river and decided to go into the water. Um, it seems like it's pretty obvious from the pictures I've kind of seen when you have an infected area like this, it looks really scummy. I don't know that that would be something that uh, people that are experienced outdoorsmen would necessarily do. Um, drinking from it, same kind of thing. I'm just wondering about what the possibilities of that are. Uh, I do know that the uh, investigation tried to determine if they had been swimming or not. They couldn't tell. Um, obviously, you know, even within a day, being in that type of heat and being in California, uh, their clothing could have dried. So they weren't sure if they had been swimming or not. Um, but what are these symptoms? Okay, these symptoms may occur within 48 hours of exposure to a water body with a suspected or confirmed algal, algal bloom. Sore throat or congestion, coughing, wheezing, or difficulty breathing, red or itchy skin or a rash, skin blisters or hives, earache or irritated eyes, diarrhea or vomiting, agitation, headache, and or abdom abdominal pain. The symptoms they're listing here, once again, uh, they don't seem like these are things that would necessarily uh, end your life. Uh, admittedly, I mean, if you had severe diarrhea or vomiting, um, dehydration and other things like that, uh, that, that could certainly be a huge risk factor based on some of the art, other articles I've been reading. Really, it seems like there's a certain level of toxicity that can stop your liver functions. And that is, um, the biggest risk. I don't know what type of time frame that would take. I, I've also seen some reference to uh, some type of nerve damage that can happen that would actually stop you from breathing. That certainly seems like uh, it could be something that fits into uh, the conditions of what's going on with this story. But another tragic aspect of this, if we look at the US Forest Service Facebook page, on July 13th, they kind of put out a warning about toxic algae in the area. After the California Department of Fish and Wildlife conducted water testing along the Merced River near Heights Cove as part of the weightable streams assessment on June 22nd and June 23rd, results show a high concentration of algae bloom. Um, so they are informing visitors who want to enjoy this area not to swim, don't wade in the water, don't allow your pets in the water, specifically because of this uh, these HABs that they have there. While harmful agal blooms, HABs, are caused by algae or cyanobacteria that grow suspended in the water column, uh, some algae grow attached to the bottom of water bodies and can form al algal mats. So that could potentially explain some of this in terms of they might have not seen that bright green foamy kind of muck that's on top of the water if this stuff was actually growing on the bottom. The water could have looked relatively clean. Uh, gotten into it and from there stirred it up and, and caused a potential issue. But unfortunately, this warning goes out about a month before they go on that hike. StanfordAdvocate.com is where we're continuing. Investigators are considering whether toxic algae blooms or other hazards may have contributed to the deaths. The area in the Sierra National Forest has been treated as a hazmat site, but the hazmat declaration was lifted and it was lifted on Wednesday. Uh, so literally they treated it as a hazmat site for about a day and then uh, went in and uh, I, I bet that was part of them being able to actually get the, the bodies out of there as well. Uh, Mariposa Sheriff Jeremy Breesey said he didn't believe the mines were a factor. So it seems like they come to the conclusion very quickly that uh, the uh, carbon monoxide poisoning probably not going on with this site. 
The State Water Resources Control Board said Thursday it was testing waterways in the area for any toxic algae blooms. Well, we know they tested it already a month before, and they certainly did find blooms. Uh, I don't know about that particular length of the Merced, though, so I bet that that's where they were looking. Interestingly, for a period of time, the deaths are treated as a homicide. Authorities were initially treating the isolated site as a hazmat scene. Now, police have said that they're treating the deaths as homicide. After failing to find any disused mine shafts in the area, in the American legal system, homicide refers to any person killing another person. Mariposa County Sheriff Jeremy Breesey said, I've been here for 20 years and I've never seen a death-related case like this. There's no obvious indicators of how it occurred. So right now we're treating the coroner investigation as a homicide until we can establish the cause. We have not found any old mine shafts near the area, he added. There are some mine shafts, but we can't confirm that it's the cause yet. Now, thinking about just the potential for this, once again, I struggle with, like, if you did think that this, this was a homicide, it looks like it's a poisoning situation. And we've still got all those same questions about the different physiology. But also, how do you contaminate the three people and the animal with that poison all at, at roughly the same time because they all pass away in, in terms of time frame extremely close? Um, the only possibility I could think of there, and I do see references in one of the articles that law enforcement is actually testing this, is uh, they did take a water pack with them, like a, a water bladder. It's sometimes called a camel pack. Uh, that they, you know, you fill it up with clean water basically at home, and then that's your water source as you go out on your hike. Usually, it's kind of a smaller, lean backpack, got a little tube that comes out of it, has a little mouthpiece, and and you just uh, draw the water right from that. Thinking that they're out there with their dog, I'm sure they're taking a bowl. I'm sure they're filling that up with water to keep the dog going while they're going on this walk as well. Where is that water coming from? Do they have a separate bottle for the dog or is it coming from that camel pack as well? But then I'm still thinking about what about the child and how do you keep a one-year-old hydrated out there as well? Are you putting water in a bottle? Where's that water coming from? Could that be coming from the same pack as well? That's the only possibility that I'm really seeing in terms of some type of potential homicide situation would be once again, a poisoning situation would have to be from a source that they're all using. And at least for the things I'm reviewing here, the camel pack is the only thing that kind of fits all that. I'm still wondering about the possibility of it because I just, the likelihood that they're going to drink the right amount that's going to take them all out within such a, sh a short period of time um, that they're all going to be affected the same way despite all the varying weights and sizes of them. I don't know. This is really got me. I just, I don't know what to think about this. And I'm not the only one struggling. Continuing at sfchronicle.com, sheriff's deputies remain mystified over how a family of three, along with their dog, perished on a remote hiking trail. This is a very unusual, unique situation, said Christy Mitchell, the spokesperson for the Mariposa County Sheriff's Office. There were no signs of trauma, no obvious signs of death. There was no note left behind saying that they had ended their own lives. They were out in the middle of a national forest on a day hike. The couple's friend, Mariposa real estate agent Sidney Radanovich, said they were such a loving couple. They loved each other quite a bit. He loved showing the baby all sorts of things and explaining them to her. She didn't understand, but he would explain them to her anyway. Radanovich recalled that once during a home buying tour, Jerish wandered off with his daughter to explore a nearby riverbed because she said he just loved to explore places and show them to her. The couple, she said, were regulars at the annual Mariposa Butterfly Festival and at a downtown brew pub, such down-to-earth people, she said. The parked car was searched, but nothing was found to help investigators to determine what happened to the family, Mitchell said. So no clues from the car as well. This is, I mean, this is a case that probably has the fewest clues that I've looked into in a long time. I mean, for physical evidence, what is there? You've got bodies and that's it. Like, how do you determine what's happened? Over at uh, mirror.co.uk, dad of Brit Hiker says family 
heartbroken. The father of much love, Mr. Jerish, has now spoken of their devastation. Speaking from his home in Bramber Bridge, Lancashire, Peter Jerish, 70 years old, said, the family are just in shock, heartbroken. Asked whether he had received any further updates, the grandfather added, we haven't heard anything more. Mr. Jerish was originally from Lancaster, Lanc Lancashire. Uh, he went on to study at Newcastle University before working in London and then obviously moving out to California after that. SFChronicle.com talks about another interesting development in terms of the area and the possibility of this algae bloom situation. On Thursday, and this article went out, um, I think it was last, yeah, just last week. Uh, on Thursday, a sign appeared to be newly installed at the start of the trail used by the family, and it warns harmful algae may be present in this water. Residents in the area said the sign was only recently posted after the family was found dead. And here is a picture of the sign. Um, and it does uh, has the same warnings we've been hearing about. Stay away from the algae and the scum in the water course with that one condition where it could be you know a, a bed a mat that's basically sitting below the water you might not see it keep children away from algae in the water um, for fish caught here uh, they want you to clean them a, a very specific way don't let your pets or other animals go into the water or drink it don't drink this water or use it for cooking that's another thing i learned in looking into all this apparently even if the water is contaminated and you think, well, I'll just boil it, that doesn't necessarily kill the bacteria. Uh, and then do not eat shellfish from this water. Uh, officials with the U.S. Forest Service's Sierra National Forest announced last month that testing along the Merced River near Heights Cove showed a high concentration of algae bloom, and they warned visitors against swimming, wading, or allowing their pets to swim in the water. The toxins produced by some algae can be harmful to humans and animals and here is a shot of the family's home in mariposa county they probably went to just venture out so it wouldn't have been like an extreme hike of any sort said uh, their friend mr jeff it was probably just kind of since they live near the trailhead hey let's take a look at these things that's another thing uh some of the information i'm running into i'm not sure if that trailhead was actually open some of those trails get closed specifically during the summer because they're worried about people hydrating and, and medical emergencies that can happen out there. I'm not 100% sure that that trail was actually open at this period of time. The family accessed the hiking path at the end of Heights Cove Road, which quickly changes from paved road to gravel to dirt. A ranger's gate blocks the final stretch that is steep and requires a four-wheel drive vehicle. After the gate, the Forest Service Road is a steep drop which eventually leads to the Savage Lundy Trailhead where the family would have hiked. Residents said there was an old barium mine and many gold mines in the area. There is no recreation area, said a neighbor, who lives next door to the family's Dura property that they also rent out on Airbnb. It's a serious hiking area. It's nothing but rattlesnakes and old mines. Um, I don't remember seeing that reference before, but a barium mine... Um, of course, I think that might be a radioactive element. Uh, just another consideration. I'm not seeing anything in terms of investigating that aspect um, in, in regards to their deaths. But with another article from SF Chronicle, not one clue. The mystery is only deepening. And here we get to hear the account of uh, how they were found. When the missing persons report for Ellen Chung and her husband, Jonathan Jerish, came in at 11 p.m. Monday, a curious sheriff's deputy had a hunch. The couple had just purchased a property near the trailhead for Heights Cove Trail, 20 miles north of town, and they love to explore the outdoors with their one-year-old daughter, Miju, and dog, Oski. He drove down the single lane red dirt Heights Cove Road until the closed U.S. Forest Service gate appeared. He was right. The couple's truck was parked at the popular but remote trailhead. That happened around 2 a.m. So at that point, he calls in for backup, and they get search and rescue teams ready to go out the next morning. Uh, of course, they go out and do their work and very quickly find them. You come on scene, and everyone's deceased. There's no bullet holes, no bottle of medicine, not one clue, said Sheriff Jeremy Breesey 
from his office in town on Friday. It's a big mystery. About one and a half miles down the switchbacks around 11 a.m. on Tuesday, the team found the family in the middle of the trail. The husband was in a seated position, the child beside him, along with the dog, and the wife just a little farther up the hill. Breesey said they believe the family was returning to their truck. A cell phone was in Jerish's pocket. There's little to no cell coverage on that section of the trail. Investigators are trying to determine if the phone saved any failed text message drafts, attempted calls or photos, along with GPS location data. Um, obviously, if they don't have great coverage out there, I don't know that they'll be lucky on the GPS stuff, but text messages... Um, that would certainly be something I'd be trying, even if I had spotty coverage, it's sometimes easier for a text message to get out. Uh, yeah, attempted calls, photos, maybe even something written, an email that was started or a note that's written. Um, I don't know, but, uh, I haven't seen any information shake out from that Avenue, but obviously the cell phone could, could help shed some light on this. The family also had a backpack with a bladder that held a small amount of water. The sheriff said. They sent the water for testing. Just, you can see there, first of all, I want to call them out for doing an amazing job. They get this thing called in at 11 at night. Within a matter of hours, they've found the vehicle. Pretty much within 12 hours, they actually find the family. Unfortunately, they're not alive, but within 12 hours of that report coming in, that's pretty amazing. Um, there was no indication whether the family had been swimming as they would have dried off by the time that they were found, he said. While temperatures were scorching Sunday afternoon, dehydration seemed like a long shot with their pet dying and the camelback still containing water. There have been few, if any, reports of human deaths linked to freshwater bacteria blooms. I, I went looking, guys. I can't find anything confirmed. University of Southern California biological sciences professor David Karen, who specializes in such proliferations, called them a threat to both animals and humans. Freshwater is a little more of the Wild West, he said. This is something that's come onto our radar in the last five, six, seven years. These types of bacteria blooms occur when nutrients in the ecosystem, such as nitrogen and phosphorus, build up. This is caused by humans, he said. As fertilizer and other chemicals seep into water systems, drought and climate change exacerbate that process. The bacteria likes warm water and stagnant, he said. You slow water down and warm it up, it gives bacteria a competitive advantage. And that's what I meant when I said it kind of looks like our number one suspect in this case is Mother Nature. There is a lot of focus going in that direction. But of course, we haven't heard anything from the medical examiner. What did they learn from the autopsy? Let's continue with people.com. Initial autopsy on family of three, mysteriously found dead on hiking trail. Turns up no clues. An initial autopsy has still left officials with unanswered questions. Mariposa County Sheriff spokeswoman Christy Michel told Fox News, we're not focusing on one specific cause at this point. There's just still so many that we can't rule out. We've looked at lightning strikes in the area. We've looked at storms, the weather, animals. We're looking at the entire area as a whole. I think it's going to be a very long and in-depth, thorough investigation because it isn't as clear cut as what some cases are. Um, it's really, this is one of the craziest mysteries that we've looked into in a while here on Brain Scratch. The Mariposa County coroner is awaiting toxicology results from the bodies, which could take a few weeks. A necropsy on the family dog is also being conducted, Mitchell confirmed to CNN. So uh, who knows? Maybe the results from the dog will bring some answers. I'm thinking the toxicology results. I mean, if we've got no obvious signs of trauma here, we've got to be looking at some form of poisoning, if it's environmental or something else. And uh, we'll see when those toxicology results come back in. Uh, are there any other avenues that they're hoping for? Well, they are hoping that the dog autopsy could shed some light over here at lbc.co.uk. Police are hoping an autopsy of the family dog will provide an explanation for the mysterious deaths. Police have said they're no longer considering homicide as a possibility, despite initially launching a murder investigation. There are now hopes that an autopsy of Oski as well as toxicology reports from the family could provide some answers. 
It's hoped that the autopsy and toxicology reports could yield answers within the next three weeks. Um, so as of the time we're recording this, we're probably still a few weeks off. And quite honestly, with a case this tough and a case of this nature, um, those results might get held up a little bit. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's possibly a month, maybe even longer before we actually hear on that. Over at mirror.co.uk, final calls on British dad's phone may hold key to how the family died. So obviously they're looking at that phone as a potential source of good information as well. There were no phone signals in the isolated spot, but analysts are due to examine whether any calls were made or any voice messages recorded. Jeremy Breesey, the sheriff, said, We've searched from the air and on foot and all over, looking for anything that may give us a clue to what occurred. Basically, it's baffling. And we've got to work through the different scenarios looking for answers. Breesey said the baby was in a backpack carrier with the dog near her father, but attached to him while her mom was 30 yards away. So that's kind of an interesting cluster as well. The baby in the backpack carrier uh, with the dog near to her and the, it says father attached to him. Um, I, I think what they mean, I don't know if maybe uh, the dog was on a strap and the strap is still being attached to Jonathan, but it seems like the baby, Jonathan, and the dog are all close to each other. And then you have Ellen about 30 yards away from all that. Um, and 30 yards, I mean, it's not a huge distance. It's really, really crazy um, how this is is looking. It's it's just not making a whole lot of sense. I. I'm very curious to see what you guys think about this in the comments down below, because my mind is just completely blown by this. Um, over at yahoo.com, relatives of the California family don't believe they were murdered. Quote, we are mystified just like everyone else. I don't want to say a great deal as there is a lot going on, said John's father, Peter. We are just waiting for the authorities to do all the tests. We are in touch with them and are awaiting the final analysis. We don't believe they were murdered. We just want people to get on with the task at hand. The Mariposa County Sheriff's Office spokesperson says they haven't ruled out anything, but murder is not high on their list. So I did run into Ellen's Instagram and uh, just a really kind of special message I wanted to share with you guys here um, during Jonathan's birthday. Happy birthday, Jonathan, and happy five months, Lil Miju. Miss Aurelia Miju, you are so lucky the universe gave you the father you have. The amount of love he has for you is truly infinite, and the way I've seen your relationship with him blossom brings tears to my eyes and warmth to my soul. Johnny, my one and only, thank you for always opening my eyes in ways I can never do for myself. The way you compliment me, makes me a better person every day. And I truly believe together, there's not much we can't do. I mean, look what we made. It's terribly, terribly heartbreaking. And I wanted to honor this family in some way. And I really racked my brain for a good way to do that. Uh, and I think this is the best thing I can do. Knowing how much they appreciated the outdoors, that they literally moved their family to be closer to the outdoors, and thinking along the lines of if there is some environmental risk in that area, we're going to need some people to raise awareness to that. I found this organization called the American Hiking Society, and uh, that's part of what they do. They get people to go to government to talk about the important issues, to keep these spaces, um, to keep them first of all, but to also keep them well-maintained, uh, make sure that they're safe and that they're there for us to use and for future generations to use. So on behalf of my amazing supporters on PayPal, Patreon, people that buy merchandise, we're going to make a donation to the American Hiking Society in memory of Jonathan, Ellen, Miju and Oski together. Thank you guys so much for helping me do that. I also want to thank people that have just joined Patreon recently. A big thank you to Hazel Amelia, Lauren Ford, and Teal Trom 
Thank you so much for supporting us on Patreon. If you want to do the same, visit lordnarts.com where you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or buy us a coffee like Tracy Combs recently did. We appreciate your support as we try to help these families in these terrible situations, and we will keep you updated on this case. I really don't know how this shakes out at this point. If we are looking at an environmental factor, um, we need to talk more about that. We need exposure raised to that. If this thing does happen to swing back into a homicide investigation, I don't know what the possibility of that is. Uh, we're certainly going to be here to help these families and help raise exposure on this as well. So one way or another, keep an eye out for updates on this case here on the channel. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll be back on Monday with a brand new episode of Case Cracked right here on the Lord March channel.